Peace is a skill, it's a muscle. There are a lot of ways to build that muscle to find peace within yourself. There are communities like this one that can lift you up in that work. Y'all have certainly lifted me up and my family up. Thank you. This is a place, a community that gives people hope and joy and love no matter who and no matter when. It's about 10 years ago, my wife and I asked Reverend Susan to officiate our wedding. And she told us that she would perform our ceremony and she wouldn't sign any marriage license until gay marriage was legalized. And at the time, my wife and I were apparently straight. Life is magical. <laughs> that day, our wedding day was beautiful. And in 10 years, I've had more beautiful days than I can remember. At the time, I thought our marriage was a, a culmination, a conclusion. In my vows, I said to Sarah that I promised to never fear age or death because I had her here with me now, which is such a good line. I got the whole bridal party crying. I absolutely cherished that moment of performance. But I'm having more beautiful days than I used to, not because I don't fear but because I'm learning to accept fear. I didn't know I had bipolar disorder until I was 34. Uh, I thought I was a man until I was 32, and I'm 36 now. I've spent a lot of my life fixing. Have you ever tried to fix a day or a job or a conversation? Some days it felt like that's all I was doing. I didn't know what it was, what I needed to fix. I just thought that something was wrong. I didn't have the words or even the certainty that something was wrong. Everything seemed to be going well. I was safe and I was supported. And yet all the time I was stressed out and tired and quiet and scared. So often very scared and I couldn't identify the problem. So the problem had to be me. I would try anything to fix it. I'd throw myself into work. I would do wind sprints at the office, literally running back and forth from desk to desk. I work in IT. And if something as simple as the printer is not working or if someone's not able to connect to Zoom, I just knew it was always my fault every time and that I should have been more proactive or I should have had more knowledge about something. I should have been more alert, perceptive, anything. In fact, I found myself afraid even when work was fine, just the fear of something potentially going wrong. And I would punch walls. I would scream. Two weeks ago, I slammed my coffee maker on the ground. I broke an AeroPress. An AeroPress is plastic. Do you know how hard you have to throw an AeroPress on the ground for it to shatter? I do. It's because I wasn't able to ship out equipment on time at the office. and. I was shaking and I just couldn't do anything right and I'm an imposter and this is the thing that will get me fired. I have failed. I was so lucky to get this opportunity and now I've thrown it away because I couldn't fix it. Learning how to handle that situation, handling that feeling, that moment of anxiety, that's what I wanted to talk about. Fixing it. When I'm mindful of that last idea, noting when I hear myself saying that I need to fix something, taking that beat and knowing that no matter what else, I don't need to fix myself. I can do the best of my job at home, anywhere, and things will work and things won't work, but no matter what, I don't need to be fixed. In therapy, the first thing I got, session one, were mantras. Mantras I do every day in the mirror. I am whole and complete. I am all I need to be. I am worthy and I am lovable. If you would like and you're able, repeat these words after me and make them about you. I am whole and complete. I am all I need to be. I am worthy 
and I am lovable. I want to dig into what that all means to me, but first I do want to reach out to anyone listening who heard me say the word mantra or four things to say every morning or repeat these words after me and immediately shut off because I see you. <laughs> I see you so hard because I do the exact same thing and I did it at therapy and I do it all the time. It's a learned response, it's sometimes a necessary defense because every day we're sold processes and products designed to fix ourselves. If you chase enough of those like I have when you're trying to fix yourself and you don't see results, you start to see that language as performative, as an advertisement for something they're trying to sell you. And if you're like me, you may have also grown up in a different congregation than this one. And I was taught a lot of words, a lot of phrases, a lot of just do this and you'll feel better things, uh, things that hurt me, things that I only realized were hurting me after a long time. And so in that first session with my uh, therapist, I, I committed to doing the mantras because I wanted help. I, I wanted to be open to help. And I'm not going to tell you, ah, they work, they fixed me, because again, there's no fixing me. The four mantras work for me because they ground me. In that moment where I could spiral, I could start running, and I don't know what to do, those words give me a place to start. That idea gives me something to hold on to. No matter what outside stimulus, whatever trigger starts the feeling of helplessness or uselessness, and I could be related to work or identity or health, whatever helps me, what helps me now, is starting with something which can't be taken away and believing that. Something that is solid, something not dependent on anyone else, something I can have direct and immediate control over. Which again, sounds like an impossibility if you've been searching for something like that all your life and not finding it, but I found it. And being able to draw on that in the moment is powerful for me. Very thankful for that. That is my piece in moments of transition, big and small. Even if I don't know the next step or what just happened, or if I don't know what's happening right now, if I can hold on to that, I don't need to be fixed. It's a privilege to share that message with you. I believe that in this moment, in the middle of all of this, whatever all of this is for you, global health crisis, political anxiety, family, work, anything, you don't have to fix yourself. Maybe that's a place you can start from if you do, remember to take that message with no qualifiers. No, when I finally get this big project done, when I finally just overcome this obstacle, I messed this big thing up, so not right now. No, no, nothing. Right now, especially right now, there's nothing to fix about who you are. You are whole and complete. You are all you need to be. You're worthy and you're lovable. In 2016, I was working gigs as an event photographer and I found myself shooting a wedding, which was also a burlesque show. And if it sounds like I'm bragging, it's because I totally am. That was the coolest event ever. On top of the burlesque wedding, it was also on Halloween. So everyone was supposed to wear a costume. So I showed up in a costume. It was the first time I dressed femme. By that, I mean a gender presentation that is culturally associated with women. But it was just supposed to be a costume, something fun. And in hindsight, my costume selection wasn't necessarily critical to a photography gig. And my primary reason for being there was to take pictures. I didn't have to spend half of my day searching through multiple outfits, uh, researching custom tailored dresses on cosplayshopper.com or shave my arms and legs and armpits for the first time ever, an eye-opening experience. I mean, I did take some great pictures, so who knows, maybe it was the shaving, but no matter, I found myself spending a lot of time and thought on this. And that day came, my wife did my makeup. She made, did my makeup today too, actually. I think she did a great job. I packed my camera and my lights and a backup boy outfit uh, in case I chickened out. And I drove to the late great Cactus Jacks on Thunderbird off 51, may it rest in power. When I got in the car, 
I remember how weird it was to see my legs sticking out from a skirt. I'd only worn pants for, again, 32 years in, in shorts for three decades, and my legs were just out there, which was very wild. <laughs> it was a very strange new experience. And that wedding, that burlesque show, that Halloween party was everything raucous and loud and messy and beautiful. And despite opera gloves that slipped on the camera buttons and a bright pink wig that kept getting in my eyes, I actually ended up getting some great pictures and everyone looked amazing. And I mean everyone. A few weeks later, I um, got a thank you card from the married couple. It included a photo of the two of them with me all dressed up. I have never seen myself at that point smile like that. <laughs> it's so genuine. It was real and I wasn't doing it for a photo. That's how I felt. It was me. I was whole and complete. <sighs> a year later and I was in Seattle. I'd come up for a video games convention because I am a nerd. <laughs> I also wanted to try something out. In the past year, I had had more opportunities to shoot with a burlesque troupe, and I was able to find more and more elaborate excuses to dress for a photography gig uh, like a girl. I decided that I was going to try dressing femme in public, not just in a safe space like the burlesque show. And so I get there and I'm putting on the outfit. That is when I realized and learned, really learned that some dresses do not have pockets. The patriarchy. I ended up borrowing a purse from the folks I was staying with, this uh, little clutch on a chain. It's a hard case designed to look like a bright yellow lemon wedge. So I have my makeup, my outfit, and this temporarily stolen purse. And I took the light rail, the link light rail into downtown. And for everyone else on that train, anybody that I passed on the street when I actually got to the show, it was nothing. I was just there with them. Me. And I remember this mix of exhilaration and relief and a little bit of annoyance because, hey, y'all, I'm being brave right now and you should despise me or applaud me. How dare you go about your business? But mostly, it was great. One of the big things I was excited to do was see a panel hosted by a transgender author I had found online. Her name is uh, Alexandra. I absolutely recommend all of her works. And I got to see her in person and we took a photo together and I bought one of her light novels. It's a little short story stapled on cardstock. I paid five bucks for it and I took it back to my little rented room on Capitol Hill and read the whole thing in a night. And the story ends with, if that's what you want, that's what you are. I just broke. It lined up for me. This thing that I was trying out was actually me. And I saw that through other people who were showing me themselves. And um, I have so many people to thank for helping me. I'd realized that I'd been so depersonalized, so removed from my own inner voice, so focused on finding an answer, a fix, something that pleases the room, that I, I never even thought to ask myself what I wanted or to even be able to hear myself wanting something. To hear myself be passionate about something, to hear myself be moved by something, not something that I would always know or would be 100% certain on. That's why the language of this book got me because it lowered the bar for me. It's not what I needed, it's that, it's what I wanted. That's all it had to be. And that's what clicked. There's still bad days. Bipolar's rough. <laughs> letting, the go, letting go of the idea of fixing yourself is also accepting that there's a world where there are things you won't be able to fix there either. Days you won't be able to fix. Days and places and things that can hurt. 
and that there will still be days that I feel powerless. Mantras help, along with the usual disappointingly effective healthy practices of eating better and sleeping and exercise and meditation. But they work for me now in a way that they hadn't for me before because I know who I'm doing them for. So often I would start a gym membership or start going to bed on time for a couple of days, uh, make any number of good choices, but I wasn't doing them for me. I was doing them to fix me. And that's exhausting because that's impossible. There's nothing to fix. Now when I work out, which I'm doing again, and when I go to bed at a reasonable hour, which I'm still kind of doing, I do it because I'm honoring myself. I'm doing something because I know it will make me feel good and that I'm worthy of feeling good. For me, before really feeling the benefits of healthy choices and internalizing them, I have to be whole and complete first. I need to be worthy first. I have to believe that and learning that belief can be hard. But I love myself while I'm doing that work. But I'm here to tell you that you can love yourself right now. You're doing the work in so many ways and you've had so much to do and everything has changed around you and you're still worthy now. You don't need to trivialize or compare yourself. You are whole and complete now. No matter what happened, no matter what will happen, you have the capacity to love yourself now, even just a little bit, and I promise you will get better at it. Peace is a muscle you build and it takes time. If you think it's selfish to spend time building yourself up and know that the people you love and care for deserve to see the version of you that loves yourself completely, I promise that your love glows and it brightens everyone around you. Start loving yourself first. Be patient and kind with yourself because there is nothing to fix. You are whole and complete. You are all you need to be. You're worthy and you are loved and lovable.